Andy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Neil. Thank you for having me. It feels a bit unusual being on the other side of the mic, so to speak. I was about to say that before we hit record, but it's going to be like reverse <laughs> model, isn't it, for you? Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully I get it right and we can do it in one take. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Between us, we should be able to get it right. How many episodes have you done back in the UK there? This week will be our 262nd episode, so oh, wow. yeah. Decent. We've recorded a lot of podcast episodes, talking Decent. about... So we've done 90, so between us, mate, I think we should be able to get it right, eh? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so Andy, tell us about the HRO roadmap. I've spoken to lots of people in the UK about HMOs, but I want to know about the roadmap in particular so that we can kind of unpack how you're helping people invest in HMOs. Yeah, well, the roadmap was a bit of a lockdown project for me, if I'm honest. So pre-COVID, I had my portfolio, which was pretty established and running very well. I had my investment management group, again, very similar. My staff were taking care of it. I'd got to that position in that business where I, you know, I was kind of removed from it. So I, I was really just overseeing the performance of the business. And obviously I had sort of various plans you know, with my own portfolio and business and other interests. But when the pandemic sort of happened, everything, everything went into sort of lockdown, didn't it? I had so little to do at that point. I was quite bored. So I turned my attention to a different type of project. And actually it was my non-exec who's JP, JP, and he was my advisor for many years. And he sort of gave me a bit of a nudge, a bit of a kick to do the podcast. He's like, mate, you know, you'd be really good at this and you've got loads to talk about. And, you know, we've talked about maybe some sort of sort of educational-based business. You know, why don't you think about it? So I did, and then simultaneously thought about how I could perhaps package not just all of my experience, but the experience of all of my network as well, which by this point was quite substantial. I mean, I had a community of many thousands of people that had happened all very organically and really had never been intending to build that to sell educational products or anything like that. It, it was more so to find good people to network with and opportunities, deals, private finance. But actually this, this period of time, which was really, really unique for me, gave me the scope to design what I wanted to be quite a different product out there for people. Typically, education-based products were quite expensive. They often required you to go to some sort of low-cost event, pretty low value, then get put into some sort of a funnel and so on and so forth. And actually, I didn't feel like it needed to be done like that at all. I wanted to make something that was the most affordable, low-cost, but at highest value, so contain an incredible amount of information to help people at different stages in their, their investment journey. And that's exactly what the HMO roadmap was. And we designed it with that in mind. And it has turned into a vault of sort of well over 400 resources, hundreds of hours of content videos. And the cool thing is it's not just me, which I think would be quite biased because like <laughs> anybody, I've got my preferences. And it actually, we draw that information and experience and the resources that we've got from our entire community of, sort of 10,000 members. So... You can listen to me, but you can also listen to you know other people in different parts of the country and other people doing different types of projects and other people who've got small businesses and people who've got large businesses. So we've got this real sort of eclectic mix of experience in there, which I think makes it incredibly unique. So I think with the low cost and the huge expanse of content that we have in there, plus you know the different experience, it makes it a really, really unique product. And people can come and they can they can use it. And then they can quit the same day, they can quit the next day, or that you know they can quit the following month, or they can quit after two or three years, whatever. We make it so easy. The objective isn't to tie people in at all. The objective is to come. If you enjoy it and you find it valuable, use it, and we make it really, really easy for people. And you know we've helped sort of over 400 members to date, so it's been an incredible resource. And I think it's helped bind the community even more. So it's helped give people platform to showcase some of their work we've nurtured relationships we've helped business happen we've brought partners in that make some of the decision making really easy for our community members because it can be tricky knowing who to go to and what prices you should be looking at so i'm really proud of what we've done but in many ways i still feel like we're just getting started and we're three years in so three years in and nearly 300 podcast episodes in as well yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it kind of you know i built it like any of my other businesses and it you know it's a pretty well oiled machine got a great team and we're pretty good at what we do now well, you know building a tech product for me was obviously alien you know it, it took me a year just to build the platform we've been live three years now but it took me a year to build it just figuring out how it all works and making sure we got it right and it wasn't the cheapest thing in the world to do but yeah now we're really proud of it really pleased with it and it's a great platform we're finding to build things on and to bolt other sort of services and products and ways of 
helping our community on. So I, I don't quite know what the future looks like for it yet, but I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, good, very good. Yeah. You mentioned there um, it runs like or some of your it runs like some of your other businesses or businesses that you've had previously. What are the yeah. businesses that you had that kind of led you to where you are now? Well, last year I exited what was my investment and management business, and that was a business I started in 2016. When I first started investing in HMOs, the first property I bought was a HMO. I'm not sure how familiar you are with my story, but that, that was in 2009-10. I was in my early 20s, and I bought a few properties, and it had been going well. But like most people, it became increasingly difficult as you know the capital requirements started to creep up after the financial crisis. And I didn't have the experience for even anyone to tell me about these sort of different solutions and methods of, of maybe raising private finance. And so over time, it became clear to me that I needed to do more than just try and buy properties to build my long-term sort of business objective out. And from starting a business that maybe fed into what I was already doing, so utilized my skills and experience and contacts in the HMO industry, but generated cash in a slightly different way was, for me, quite an obvious solution. And by this point, I'd already been asked by some people to help with their management and find them properties. And so it's really pulling together of all of that stuff. And out of that grew the, the management investment agency. We, we ended up buying and building and developing stuff across several cities, all very much sort of specializing in HMOs. Mm -hmm. And um, and over a course of six or seven years, you know, optimized it and systemized that business so that I could sell it and exit it. And that's exactly what I did. But there's got to be a real intention to doing that, I think. And and that was something that I got much better at as I got a bit older and developed a bit more experience. I really needed to learn that. But, you know, with the right systems, processes and people, you can build a good business that you can sell. And along the way, it just really helped me continue to build my own portfolio as well. So it was a good decision. I'm glad I did it. And it was the right time for me to exit that business last year as I moved on to other things. But I do think it's really important to and not just that type of trading business also with your property business most people want to build an engineer scenario where they got time and freedom of choice you know and that purpose of building a portfolio for many people but it's quite easy to get sucked in <laughs> uh, and build yourself another job yeah. and so for me like starting with that end in mind and designing it out with that mind and being quite intentional about it is really really important yeah, interesting what you say there. The very same thing happened to me as I kind of built my own portfolio and became financially free. I stepped away from my job in the oil and gas industry and then people started asking me to help them and that's how my business was born. And yeah, it kind of pulls you along, doesn't it? And you learn along the way. Where did you learn to build out systems and processes and hire the right people for the team and stuff like that? Well, I mean, I think I learned a lot of it the hard way and often finding that, you know, we were doing it a little bit too late, but I think that that's okay. And I think actually that's kind of part of the journey and the fun of business building that, that I particularly enjoy. I do like building businesses, but my mentor, JP, I mentioned him briefly, uh, John had already built a very established multi-branch agency managing thousands of homes. And John was a real sort of guiding light for me and you know, helped kind of me see this sort of stuff and helped make sure that we were building this in the right way and keeping me on the straight and narrow. And that was actually quite quite an important part of the process for me. So I think I learned from other people. I learned from my own mistakes. And then, you know, eventually I started to learn from, you know, the good results that we, we were getting. And, and then I would take that and I would sort of try and replicate it in another area of the business. And and now it's something I do across all of my businesses. Mm. Do you think working with a, a mentor like JP has helped you become a better coach and mentor for your students? Yeah, for sure. I can't remember off the top of my head which podcast episode on the HMO podcast, our show, it is. But there is an episode where I talk about what I think was the most valuable, you know, the best decision that I've made today in business. And it was for sure working with a mentor because that person gave me the encouragement and the motivation and the inspiration and kind of the confidence to do stuff that before that you just not only would I not have done and tried to do but would I have even possibly thought about and, and maybe knew were possible I'll give you an example when I started the investment and management agency got off to a pretty good start but very quickly like most businesses we started to run out of cash and, and we needed more cash to feed the growth of the business so the question was well where do we get this cash from? We either wait and we sort of start to, you know, accumulate the revenue that we're making that will sort of dictate the pace or we look at this a bit more aggressively and find solutions to raise capital and, and obviously raising private finance in a debt basis 
was an option, raising it through an equity basis was an option. And, and actually what we decided was to sell some equity in the business. And quite early on in that business's life, we took the business onto what was Europe's biggest, and still is Europe's biggest crowdfunding platform. This is quite unique and never really been done in the property space before. And we rent and raised about £300,000 and, you know, in a post money valuation, the business is about 1.3 million. And I mean, in fact, maybe even at this time, I was still working as a physio. I can't quite remember, which was what I was doing professionally before I went full time in property. And that was just not a natural way of thinking to me. I didn't know that this sort of stuff existed, that you could do this kind of thing, that there were people interested in this kind of business and like methods of investment. So just a good example. Yeah, it, you know, having a good mentor made me see things, helped me see things that I didn't even know were there as well. That's the idea of a good mentor, right? I think so. And just someone to keep you then accountable, someone to keep you focused. And I definitely did need that. I did need someone. I was always prepared. And in fact, often w- would work more than I needed to because I, I really w- or, you know, always wanted to make it work. But it was still easy to be distracted by the things that I thought would be, you know, the solution to making it work. And um, different types of properties, expanding to different locations too quickly, trying to get the office, get a high street office set up too quickly, spending too much money on brand and making things look good. And there's so many decisions, big and small. But yeah, a good mentor, someone who's had that experience can just help keep you focused. And I think a lot of people, and I mentor a lot of people myself now, and you know, I think the people who are able to focus. And um, for sure, you know, are able to achieve so much more in, in much shorter spaces of time. You see it, and I think the clues quite early on when some people are looking at maybe HMOs and service accommodation and rent to rent, and they're trying to do the, you know the first development. <laughs> and so often, it, you know, it's really difficult to do all of that because then there's you know property's pretty tough, and there's a lot of stuff that we don't know and that can go wrong or can just drag you in, and inevitably you end up spreading yourself quite thinly and not getting any of the results in any of the areas that you may have done had you just sort of focused on one thing first and got it up and running, systemized, put the process and put the people in, then moved on to the next thing. And for me, a good example of that would probably be a lot of my attention now, not all of it, but a big chunk of my attention is turned towards larger developments. And that speaks more to my longer term objective of wealth creation as, to, as opposed to just sort of cash flow, which has been primarily the HMOs. Yes, they have created a lot of wealth, but development is is much less about cash flow and much more about longer term yeah. health credit. and that's a very new thing for me and before the last sort of few years it, it was never the right time for me to do it and spend that time and energy looking into it and trying to figure it out but you know as i've moved through my own journey you know, t- that time has come and, and it was something i always wanted to do and i've been able to completely focus on it and the last call i've had this morning is we've just been in a design meeting about one of the schemes we're working on at the minute. And I'm still learning lots about that. And I'm quite involved in that at the minute. And I'm sure at some point in the future, you know, I'll be able to step back a little bit more so from that. But yeah, I I think it's that's kind of a good way of looking at a mentor and, and how they can maybe help you along the process towards your targets and goals and objectives at some point in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. There was a few things you said there that made me giggle because it reminded me of when I was in my early stages and I just had this silver object syndrome where everything you, you start to see opportunities everywhere right and like you said you're going to do rent to rent you're going to do service accommodation you're going to do here tomorrow's on development that was me i was trying to do too much and um again it was a mentor that helped me focus on on the here tomorrow and uh it got us to where we are now so the next best thing about the next mentor that i got was my business partner who had sort of built a business a lot bigger than what we'd had now and when we bring problems to him when i raise problems to him he just kills a cucumber and just like oh yeah when this happened to me previously this is what i did or this is the person that you need to speak to and whilst it helps you focus i think it also helps you remain calm when the shit's going all over the place (laughs) good business right he's all about what you do when things are not going to plan like you know it's great when the money's coming in the tenants paying the rent and planning comes through and you know (laughs) the builder finishes on time but actually being good at business is managing everything when you know, it's not going the way that you want and need it to. And actually property, that happens more often than not, I would say. And I think without the experience, without working with people who've got the experience, it's difficult to understand just how often that can happen and just how substantial some of the problems can be. good example would be the disappointment that the people, I'm sure a lot of people listening today will feel if and when a valuation might come in that isn't actually where the expectation was, you know, it's gut wrenching and we've all been there. <laughs> and um, 
But actually, when you've been through it a few times and you kind of, you understand it and you get it, you can plan a bit better for it. You understand that, okay, well, we could try this as an alternative. So yeah, I think there's different things that you learn along the way, but for sure, embracing the, the top stuff and realizing that that is actually where, you know, good business ship, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that's a word, is created it is really, really important. And managing your emotions during them rocky times as well, right? Very difficult. <laughs> I mean, and I think because property is so slow, it is quite emotionally taxing. Like we can't help but get involved and get quite emotional about stuff. But it is important to be able to, you know, step away from that and actually look at things logically and find a logical conclusion to a problem. Mm, absolutely. Let's talk about the journey, Andy, because you mentioned there, uh, did you say you started investing in HMOs in 2010 and a HMO was your first, first investment as well? Yeah, that's right. It was a residential property at the time. Uh, I was actually going to see something down the street, went in, immediately could tell the floor plan wasn't quite right. And the agent said, well, actually, I've got something that might be coming on the market just up the road. Do you want to see if I could get you in? I'd traveled all the way from Cornwall to sort of the, the Midlands to see this property. So this was like an, a 10 hour round trip for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was really grateful. Yes, please. And Went in and the floor plan and this other one was was just perfect. But I really didn't know anything else, Neil. I was just looking for a good floor plan that I thought I could get a certain number of bedrooms in. And that was honestly the extent of the research and due diligence I'd done. I wanted to rent to students because I'd been a student not long before that and I understood the simplicity of the model. In fact, I didn't know that there was a way of doing it differently. I didn't know at the time you could do it to maybe professionals or maybe social sort of a demographic of tenant but yeah sort of quite you know naive really just sort of wandered into it wanted into this it was a little bit easier then than it is now the banks didn't ask as many questions I managed to borrow a very small amount of money thirty thousand, which i paid back as soon as i could once it was up and running and yeah just went on my builder or my hammer or whatever it was got some people around got some quotes <laughs> picked one did the work and to be honest and i think this is a good lesson for a lot of people there is stuff that could have gone wrong and, and there was stuff that went wrong for sure. But actually, because I got the fundamentals right, which were the location and the, you know, the optimization of the floor plan, it's worked for till nearly 20 years now. And actually those problems, whatever they were, are long, long, long forgotten and property is quite <laughs> forgiving. So I think if you do stick to the fundamentals and you don't overexpose yourself and put too much at risk, actually... You can make mistakes in property. You can make mistakes in the HMO space as well. And over time, you know, the market will forgive you. And, you know, I've done so incredibly well out of that very first property since I bought it. And and I got a bit better at, you know, my, doing my due diligence and planning and preparing, you know, as I went on and bought the second and third and the fourth and so on. But yeah, that, I guess that's kind of how the first one started. So what were you doing back in 2010 and what made you choose the HMO as your first investment? Why not a standard investment property like everybody else does? Well, I graduated from university in 2009. You know, we were probably at the bottom of the market in terms of financial crisis. We didn't really know that at the time, but the job market was quite tough, actually. And I graduated as a physio in Sheffield and... There were not that many jobs available for juniors. And also, you know, there was Nottingham University and Wakefield and Leeds and Manchester. We were all churning out, you know, one to 200 physios a year as well, all looking for jobs. So I thought, well, rather than stick around here and look for a job, I'm going to go down to the Southwest. I'm going to go and surf and at least, you know, at least, <laughs> at least wait to find a job by the beach. And that's exactly what I did. But I'd had a little bit of sort of experience on building sites. My uncle was a builder. I'd done a bit of laboring work and I always enjoyed it. And as I said, I'd been a student myself. And my sister, who's a few years younger than me, as I was finishing university, she was just sort of in a second year at university. And so I decided that actually buying a property and doing it where she's a student and just using this model that I sort of understood probably more than stand by to let, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. all seemed to make the most sense to me. So actually... It was probably for lack of a better idea. It wasn't actually that I was comparing it to anything else. I really didn't know much about anything else. I only really had experienced HMOs. You know, because yeah, you lived in it. Yeah, exactly. And I could say, oh, my, my landlord wasn't doing a huge amount. It didn't look that difficult, you know. So I didn't feel like it was, there were that many reasons why it, it wouldn't be possible at, at the time. So yeah, again, probably quite naively, just went straight for the jugular on it. And uh, then it turned out okay in the end. Is that where you got your floor plan idea from? The one that you used to live in when you were looking at the floor plans for, to purchase? 
No, probably not. I, th <laughs> I think really I was just looking at, I had enough sort of common sense to know that if the existing floor plan kind of lent itself to having a certain number of bedrooms, that would keep the, the costs down. And, and obviously I didn't know too much about building and structure. And so it was just for me, it would have been a bit easier as well. So if there was an easy way to, to divide the property or put rooms, turn certain rooms into bedrooms, that was always going to help. And th this particular property just, just so happened to have that really. It's quite easy from that point of view. Cool. And what stage were you at in your life when you could actually stop working as a physio and just go full time into the HMO space? Thought, well, not that you knew you were going to at the time, but... No, I mean, it took me a few years before I actually paid enough attention to what I was doing in the property space to realize that I was probably, you know, wasting my own time pursuing a professional career. And over sort of the three or four years after I graduated, I started to enjoy my professional work less and less. I actually continued to work as a physio for about six years and I became a clinical specialist and did work with a lot of great people and I enjoyed that part of the role. But I, I mean, after the first sort of couple of properties, I was probably on par with my earnings from a professional salary um, as a physio and then on my third and fourth, obviously started to supersede that. And I think I stuck with it longer than I needed to because I just, didn't have anyone to tell me that it was okay. I didn't have that self-belief even at that point that that was a, a future for me. And, and actually it took a bit of a, a life sort of changing moment for me to kind of really make me sit up and, and realize it. It was, it was probably around, I can't remember the year, but I was 26 at the time. We bought the first one when I was 21, so five years in. And I remember... Um, I hadn't been feeling too well. I was living in Cornwall at the time. I hadn't been feeling too well. I was having a lot of neck pain, struggling to swallow, lost some weight and things like that. And I'd been sort of trying to speak to the doctor about this, who happened to be one of my colleagues because I ran the clinic in the GP surgery. So I was talking to not just a GP, but actually you know, a colleague of mine as well. It was a tough conversation to have. And these symptoms kept going on. I wasn't feeling great, continued to sort of not feel particularly well. But yeah, they just put it down to a bit of stress and general anxiety. And for sure, I was feeling a bit stressed and a bit anxious because I was having these symptoms. Uh, and in the end, the only thing that I could put it down to was you know, feeling stressed and anxious was was work. By this point, I wasn't just wasn't enjoying it as much. And I was starting to get a bit frustrated that I wanted to be doing a bit more of the property stuff, but I was having to you know, be here and do these clinics and stuff. So actually, I, I decided to take a break from the physio and I, the plan was just to go away do another season out in the mountains and take a break and surely that would be enough to just to relax me and you know and these symptoms of sort of stress and anxiety whatever it would be would, would go away as it happened my symptoms got a bit worse just before i was meant to go away. i booked my tickets and everything you know, i'd left my house left my job and um, really handed notice in on everything and about two weeks before i was meant to go i happened to go back into the gp for another appointment and saw somebody else a locum doctor and he actually sort of checked my neck and he sort of said, you know, there's something that I'm not totally happy with and actually sent me up for a scan that day. And I could tell when I was getting the scan that, that something wasn't quite right. And on the way home from my scan, I got a call from my GP who sort of said, look, Andy, you know, they're not happy. You know, there is something on your scan there and it, it looks like something that we, you know, we might need to look at more closely. He knew about my trip at this point. It's like, like I think you're going to have to put your trip on hold. Anyway, fast forward a few days, ended up having surgery and actually they confirmed. And I, I remember where I was when I got the call. I'd actually gone back up to one of my properties I was doing work on at the time, gone up for the weekend and I was sitting in in, you know, in this building site and I got a call from a consultant who said, you know, Andy, you know, this is a, it's a cancer, it's just thyroid cancer. And um, that was sort of obviously at that point that turned everything upside down. And I had honestly literally left my job work and had this trip booked and, and all of a sudden everything came to a bit of a grinding halt. And like, the good news is everything's fine now. And um, and it's all, you know, it, it was okay in the end. But it took that to make me realize that, you know, even I at that age, you know, I was fit, I was surfing all the time. You just can't take anything for granted. You know, mm -hmm. potentially these you know, things in life can be taken away very, very quickly. And... Um, in a strange way, it was one of the best things that happened to me because it made me, it gave me the confidence and the ability to justify just thinking differently and, and saying, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to do it. And that's that's what I started to do. And in the end, I managed to get out and do my trip, at, at, you know, a bit, bit later than planned. But I came back and went sort of 
headstrong into the business and, and really started to focus on building you know, this business that I wanted to build a life that I wanted in case it ever got taken away from me too quickly. I wanted to enjoy yeah. the process as well. Yeah. So that's that's what I did and I really focused on it. And I continued to just locum a little bit as a physio, just allowed me to pull, pull a pretty good wage and supplement my property income and just help with some mortgaging and things like that. And I did it for another 18 months, I think. And, and then I was here and I left it completely and, and never, never looked back. And I, I don't know whether that was maybe eight years ago, something like that now, I can't, can't quite remember. But again, it was one of the really good decisions that, that I made. And in retrospect, maybe I should have made it earlier, but actually it just kind of worked out okay in the end, you know? But yeah, maybe it, you know, it took me being pushed, I think. Kind of forced it and making the decision. And interestingly, I have a lot of people I've worked with, some have been incredibly successful and some not as successful. One of the things that I've noticed and observed myself is the people who have been pushed Maybe they were made redundant or or whatever. They've actually the higher proportion of people there who've gone on to do better. And I think it's because the most dangerous place to be is in the comfortable zone, that comfort zone where there's nothing to pull you. You know, there's not enough of a draw because it's not like you're suddenly going to be replacing your income from property and it's suddenly going to give you the life that you want. There's also nothing pushing you. You've not left your job. You've still got your salary coming in. You can still... Go and get your avocado and toast on a, you know, a Saturday morning, <laughs> you know. And, and actually, I think I was probably guilty of that myself. And, and I've seen that pattern with other people. And I'm not one for saying that you should just go, you know, if you want to build a property business, you just quit your job tomorrow. I say, I don't think that's the way to do it. But I think understanding that one of the most limiting factors is is that the belief around what a job is actually providing for you whilst you do that. And for most people, it's comfort more than anything else. A lot of people are just not prepared to make sacrifices and compromises. The most valuable thing you can give your business is actually your time and attention. It's not the money that you earn or the additional savings that you can pull over. There's actually solutions to finding that alternatively, raising private finance, whatever it is. So yeah, I, that's something that I learned myself and I've seen myself, but I think it's an interesting one. Mm, definitely, definitely. Let's talk about student accommodation because we had a little discussion off air before we hit record and I've purposely avoided student accommodation over in Western Australia, but it's something that you've delved into quite quite a lot, isn't it? Where um, do you see the difference in student accommodation compared to a lot of the other UK HMO investors I've spoke to when their focus is on professional HMO accommodation? Well, the most wealthy people I know in, in our industry from my network are unquestionably my friends who own very substantial student HMO portfolios. There are very few people that own substantial. And when I say substantial, I'm talking about sort of upwards of 50, 50 homes, certainly upwards of 100, 100 properties in the professional space. And there are some in the social space. But the student model is very, very scalable. It's a really condensed radius that you, you tend to be operating in. And it's very predictable, especially you know, certainly if you pick the, the right university towns, very predictable in terms of the numbers of people at university, the race that people will pay, the cyclical nature of, of it. And that just lends itself to building a really good business off the back of. Professional accommodation is a bit trickier because same predictability and the same regularity just doesn't exist for those reasons that, you know, um, the it's not quite as mainstream with the banks. There's a lot of banks that will lend, but it will always be more expensive than it will be on student HMOs. And a lot of people are surprised when I tell them this, but, you know, I was getting rates of, you know, when the rates were quite peaky of sort of 5.4 of my student HMOs at 75% loan to value, people in the professional market were getting six and a half to seven and a half percent. Interesting. And a lot of that is just the difference in opinions of people's confidence in the market, but valuers banks and, and so on and so forth. So for me, the student market is reliable. It's very robust. There's a huge amount of data there that you know we can look back on to then predict where our business will go or the performance of our properties will go. And I like that in business. It means that I can invest sensibly. It means that I can invest in infrastructure resource like systems and processes and team members, maybe offices and whatever it might be. It's trickier to do that with the professional model, but there are definitely some some caveats and some downsides. You know, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher in the student market. Now, if you're just getting started, that's really tough. I get it. Um, investing in professional accommodation or maybe social accommodation can be a bit easier if you're not as restricted about where you can do it. So if you step outside of the Article 4 directions, it can be a little bit cheaper, a bit easier to get into the market. 
But then, of course, you lose some of that rental confidence that the student market gives you. So there's pros and cons, but for me, those pros really outweighed the cons. And whilst I think I probably could have bought more properties had I pursued other strategies, <clears throat> it's worked really, really well for me long, long term. And it's made it quite an easy business to then operate, you know, in, into the future. So for me, I, I kind of like that balance of things. What about vacancies and boys during off season when the students aren't at universities? Do we do you have to factor vacancies in there? I've not had a void in a student HMO in twenty years. Really? Ever. <laughs> Ever. So again, I think it boils down to understanding your location in the university town. But if we take the city I'm in now, there's probably, you know, couple of thousand student HMOs even as a landlord with a sort of small five to ten units or portfolio of properties and um, that's a fraction of that market and actually you don't have to be doing anything exceptional to put yourself towards the top end of that market where tenants want to live in your house before over living in somebody else's house. And I really like that about the student market. One of the great things, you know, Article 4, it's really frustrating for a lot of people, but actually when you're in the market, Article 4 is great because it's the council, it's the local authority saying, we are going to limit the competition. Now, we're, we're not going to allow many more people to come and do this. So actually, if you're in and you've already got your property, we're going to kind of help make sure that you've always got tenants for it. So as long as the university has good supply of tenants, good university town, that rental confidence, this is what I mean, is, is so robust and gives you that predictability. And my students typically maybe move home for the summer, but actually the trend typically now is that actually they want to leave all their stuff here over the summer anyway. So I actually do 51 week lets where we take the price for a year, we prorate it over 51 weeks, the tenants move out. And in that week, we have free, we get in, we clean the property, we do any maintenance we need, and then we get it ready for the new tenants. And actually, as it happens, this week that we're recording is literally the week that that happens. So that week's void, so to speak, it's all built into the price that they pay for the, the rest of the year anyway. So effectively, there is no void cost to it at all. And a lot of people do run 52-week contracts as well. That for me is just a bit too challenging in terms of getting the properties turned over. We did used to do it. Um, and some people do run it over 48 weeks, but but generally speaking, the REM will be sort of prorated and come out where it needs to be. So actually, it's not a cost avoid as such. It's more just about an actual practical void in the house, which is another great thing about student houses. If you've got a period of time that you can get into one of your houses to do some works, it's really hard to do that in a professional HMO or a social HMO where people are on different tenancies. You, know, you can't just get everyone to vacate the house for a week while you go in and pay to be decorated. So... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do students have a different expectation of the standard that they're going to live in compared to a professional? And does that differ in the room rate as well? Yeah. I mean, one of the really cool things that's happened over the last five to 10 years is that PBSA, purpose-built student accommodation, uh, has increased. The supply of that has increased. But more importantly, the standard of that has increased. So the standards of some of the PBSA blocks now for students are, are almost platinum standard. They've got basketball courts and rooftop bars and cinema rooms. And um, the cool thing is about that, students tend to want to live there for the first year. And overseas students tend to be quite comfortable living there. But after that first year, for most students, certainly the native students, like British students, they want to go out and get that that university experience of living in a house with their mates for the first time. Yeah. And actually, that's a cultural thing in our country. And you know, a lot of these big block providers have tried to change it with incentives and providing all these swanky facilities. But actually, changing the mindset and changing the, the, the actual behavior of a community, which students are, is very difficult. And you know, as you might imagine, it would be to change the behavior um, and way of living of any other community. And so what we've found is that these platinum sort of standards have pulled the rents up in the market. They've almost served as then a feeder for higher rents in the private residential sector. Mm -hmm. So what we've learned is that students are able and willing to pay for more for their rent if the standards are better and they're happy with the value that they're getting. So we've been able to do that in the private rental sector, not mm -hmm. to the same level as the PBSA. And I think that that's fine. We, we don't need to, to be able to justify our investments working and performing well, but um, it's provided this feeder mechanism. And yes, you know, with that has come some increased expectations about maybe the service. They're used to almost having a concierge type of service and everything. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, there is some management of expectations to be done there. But then at the same time, 
we've had to get better. We've had to be more reactive. We've had to be better at communicating as well. And that's something that we've certainly as a business you know, tried to do and really prioritized over the last five years. So I think there's been a sort of a meeting of expectations mm. to some extent as well. But um, I actually think that we're not competing with this PBSA combination, this platinum standard. Actually, it's been quite helpful for us. And, and again, it is something that a lot of people have been quite fearful of. And I've said on the podcast a number of times, and I think you're thinking about it differently. And look, I can show you the evidence to, you know, as to why. Yeah, you raise some very good points there. It's interesting that you say the PBSA. What, what's PBSA stand for? Purpose Built Student Accommodation. Purpose Built Student Accom. Interesting how that's become your competition and not the professional uh, HMO. And, but well, that's they're... lifted the standard of yours. Yeah, but be mindful. It's not become competition, actually. Yeah. It's it's almost elevated yeah. what we've been able to provide and achieve in the private rental sector. So, yeah. And for most people, let's say 98% of people who live in the private rental sector but it was probably never a choice between living here and living in pbsa it's probably a choice between living in my hmo and living in your hmo yeah because it's a very different experience then that's actually what they're looking for they want a garden and they you know they don't want security telling them what they can and can't do and <laughs> you know they want to have house parties and you know that's the reality but i think actually that has been quite steadfast it's not changed despite the efforts, and not just of the developers, but also the councils. The councils have really tried to push these students into PBSA because it suited them. The idea was that they could then free up our HMOs back to the PRS for you know families or to, to sell or whatever. But that's just not happened. They have not been able to convince students to do it. And I'm glad, you know, it's not something I think that they should be trying to convince them to do either, you know, but yeah. I think they're trying to move communities of people, which we wouldn't tolerate if it was anyone else. It's, you know... It's almost anti-student in some ways, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, it hasn't actually hindered us. It's actually been favorable for us, really. Nice, nice. Good stuff, mate. I think we'll finish on the investment and management business, which you do recently sold, haven't you? Well, I sold that about just over a year ago, yeah. Yeah, okay. How was the journey from, you know, that first client that you worked with to passing on to somebody else? Oh, I mean, the days of despair, you know, running that business. There were days of resentment where I would resent how much it, it required of me. And then there were like real wins and great moments. And I met incredible people along the way. And for me, it was definitely an important part of the foundation that I built that allowed me to go on and do different things. We talked about the roadmap. That was one. My other businesses that I've since built and, and continue to build. But, uh, you know, it's a real learning curve. And, uh, you know, in the end, actually selling it proved not to be that difficult because, I had a great network of people that I could go to with it. We had a good business with good team. Um, we had a good operating model, we had good revenues. And and actually that in itself taught, taught me a lot. But I think going back to what we said earlier, it was all about sort of building it with the end in mind mm -hmm. and focusing on it. You know, while I was doing that, I wasn't mentoring and training and building other businesses. I was really just, just doing that for six yeah. or seven years. And for six or seven years, I probably, you know, on paper took a huge pay cut while I did it. But that's kind of the sacrifice sometimes you need to make. And I think it's important to be able to see beyond that. I think it's quite short-sighted and easy to be short-sighted sometimes when you're building businesses. You know, often actually the real gains come much further down the line, the real benefits. And sometimes the real benefits are much greater than you can, can actually imagine anyway. Not, not just, you know, in terms of finances and, you know, monetarily, but... Actually, in, in other opportunities that can come your way as, as a result of being in that space for so long and so many years. But um, it was a great experience and yeah, I don't regret any of it at all. And, and, it, and it absolutely was the right time for me to kind of step back and, and hand it on to somebody else. When you say start with the end in mind, did you know that you were going to take it to a certain point and then sell it on to somebody else? The plan was always to sell it. Yeah, yeah. always to sell it. Was it to um, sell it the size that you did or were you, was it going to be bigger? Was it supposed to be smaller or was it bang on point? I mean, it'd always be nice to, you know, to sell something that was a bit bigger, but I think that that's, you know, there's probably no end to that. Like how big is big enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, it was for me, it was just, it was just the right time. It was the right combination of timing and other opportunities for me. And price, and also the person that, that that I could hand the business to, um, I want to be comfortable with that as well. Mm. But management is not an easy business. So managers get a bit of a bad rap yeah. in um, when you talk, you know, in the HMO space. But actually, it, it's very difficult. There's so many moving parts. There's a lot of expenses to it, and actually, you've got to be very, very good to make good money in that in that industry. So, you know, it, it was important to me that 
I could hand the business to someone that was going to carry, you know, carry the baton and, and look after the staff and continue to grow on it. So in the end, yeah, a great experience, but absolutely the right thing at the right time for me to exit that business. And, and I'm, you know, I'm really proud of what we achieved over the years. You know? Well done, mate. Well done. What are you doing with all your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think there was some spare time for maybe a day. Uh, <laughs> You know, the roadmap and the training and education ecosystem has been a a real passion project for me. And we've helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people now. And I think it's been great for the wider industry. Um, So I'm really proud of that. And it still takes a certain amount of my time. I'm developing a lot more, which you may have seen now. So we're, you know, right now, sort of developing in the region about 60 homes out. You know, we've got more to do next year. So that's certainly not going to stop over the next four or five years and plan to, to do a lot more there. And, and that takes time until we get to a position where we can maybe step away a bit more. And, um, you know, just on a personal level, I'm actually trying to move house. Gemma and I are moving ourselves. We, we've got a big project there for our own residential project to do. So there's not much free time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it's going, but what I would say is I'm choosing how to spend the time, Neil, which I think is and always was the most important thing to me. You know, it's up to me to say... I'm going to spend my time here or I'm going to put it here. Very rarely do I feel like I'm being dragged into things that actually I don't want to be doing. And that for me is great having a long-term objective and a goal to fixate on and work towards. But actually, I think it's really, really important to enjoy the process and enjoy the journey. And for me, in in a real nutshell, that is exactly it. It gives me the time and the freedom and the choice to do what I want, when I want, to, to a large extent, how I want. And so I just love, you know, I kind of just love getting up every day and doing things like this and, you know, and, and designing the projects and, and everything. So, you know, I'm really pleased with where things are at the minute, even though I don't necessarily feel like I've got loads of time just to go and put my feet up, you know, in the garden. Yeah, that's overrated anyway, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, you'd be bored by the sound of things. Especially in the UK. I mean, you know, maybe I feel a bit different. It was nice and sunny outside all the time, like where you are, but, you know... <laughs> Oh, here in the UK, it's nice to, yeah, it's definitely nice to have plenty to do. Yeah. You're in the middle of summer over there now, aren't you? Well, apparently so, but I mean, if you looked out the window right now, Neil, you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just as you were saying there about um, having the time and freedom, I was thinking of the phrase, like, do what you love and love what you do. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing, mate. So congratulations and uh, thank you so much for your time on the podcast today. It's been good catching up. Thanks, Neil. It's been a real pleasure.